Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Leah Jelke, and I am the National Network of State Teachers of the Year Member Engagement Coordinator. And we are so happy to have you guys here tonight uh, for this webinar, our webinar on schools and families working together for student success, how policy can help. And I am joined today by the amazing Barbara Hicks. Um, Barbara is a senior policy analysis at National Education Association, and she works there to build teacher leadership, especially among early career educators. And she is a former assistant director for the Mid-Atlantic Equity Center, and she has worked to develop state systems of support for districts and schools through the George Washington University. So we are so ha happy to be partnering with her tonight to bring you this webinar. This webinar is based off our 2023 Legislative Education Agenda for NSTOI, partnering with NEA. So with that, I will let Barbara take it away. Hello, everyone. I'm very honored to be addressing State Teachers of the Year and their supporters this evening. And let's see what we can hear and learn about policy. Thank you. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that here at the NEA, we meet on the traditional lands served by the Anacostan people. Now in the 1660s, the Anacostans were rounded up and relocated to a tiny island in the middle of the Potomac River. By the time the 1700s rolled around, their population was so diminished that they had to join the Piscataway tribe just to survive, thus losing their tribal identity. Nonetheless, today we honor America's first people and all elders, past, present, and emerging. Next. Today, I'd like to touch on several topics with you. What research tells us about family involvement, about community conversations, which is a tool, parent-teacher home visits, which are another tool, and full-service community schools, which is a very deluxe tool to deal with family involvement. I'd also like to point out where we are at the moment on federal policy on family involvement and some current policy issues. So what does research tell us about family involvement? I'd like to refer you to a wonderful book called Beyond the Bake Sale. This is no longer extremely new, but it's a wonderful compilation of all the research that deals with family involvement and its effect on students. Next. So students whose families are involved in what they are learning have many positive outcomes, better grades, they tend to enroll in more challenging classes. They graduate at a higher rate. They're more likely to go to college or career programs after school. They have more positive attitudes towards school and they behave better at school and outside of school. Next. So there are different kinds of family involvement. All of them are valuable. I wanna just sort of mention what a few of them are. Certainly parents working at home with students on their homework, supporting what goes on in the classroom is very important. Parents volunteering in schools, reading stories, helping tutor in math, um, helping with science experiments, this is great. Parents who involve themselves in school and district decision-making have a very large impact and their voices need to be heard. And uh, finally, parents who talk with their students about the future and what they need to be doing in order to have the future that they hope for. All of these are excellent roles for families. Next. So for middle and high school children, and let's face it, there's less family involvement at these levels. We find that when families are involved, those students make a better transition from middle to high school and they maintain the quality of their work. You know, sometimes we have a slump in the middle grades that can be avoided. Uh, these students develop good and realistic plans for their future. It's not all about, I'm going to be a professional baseball player. And they're less likely to drop out of high school. Next. All of this becomes more important when we talk about children from diverse cultures, because when we have students who may not speak English or from different cultures, there is a, a gap that opens up between home and school culture. We need people to be very intentional about bridging that gap, both people who work at schools and people who are in the children's families. Next. 
So notice that this little guy is golden because his truth is the golden truth about the best thing you can do about family involvement. Make sure that all family partnership activities focus on what students are learning. Now, I already mentioned some things that actually don't involve student learning, and those are important. But if you want students to learn more and have better learning outcomes, the kind of family engagement that will get you there is the kind that is focused on what students are learning. So if, for example, we're studying in school how to transfer fractions to decimals, there should be games and activities going home about transferring fractions from decimals. If we're learning in English about rhyming couplets, maybe we have an evening at school where parents and students write rhyming couplets that can be expressed as a rap. But you have to focus that family engagement on what students are learning if you want them to learn more. Next. So what would this look like at the school level? Well, we'd look our, our, our bulletin boards would look different, for example. They would display student work along with the rubric that's used to evaluate that work so students and their families can see what we're shooting for. We would have a particular day of the week, maybe Friday, when parents know that they should ask their students for folders or notes from the teacher or when they will receive a call or an email from the teacher to update them on what's going on. Uh, there would be special events focused on math, literacy, health, family questions about the school program. Parent-teacher conferences would be led by the students. Those students would be discussing their own work with our, with our parents. They would not be excluded from these conferences. And college planning workshops and information on college admission would be available at the middle and high school level. We would not see so many beautiful bulletin boards expressing the joy of different seasons. Um, sadly, those would be missing. And we would not have a lot of calls home that are only about student misbehavior. We would have much more consistent communication than that. We would not have a bunch of teachers sitting around saying, my Lord, we've got to get these parents into a parenting class because they don't know what they're doing. And it wouldn't be about parenting. It would be about what students are learning. We would focus on student behavior and shortcomings only when necessary and not at parent-teacher conferences. Those would be about what students are learning. Finally, we would lose all those posters about drug abuse and teen pregnancy. Next. Okay, I named this slide Fragments of Federal Policy on Family Involvement because things are very fragmented. Let me tell you about a few things and then you'll see the fragments. Recently, in 2022, um, the federal government authorized a very tiny $5 million program. It's the statewide family engagement centers. $5 million was only enough to support eight of these. However, these eight centers are focused on something important. They support family school partnerships that lead to academic recovery. So you can see this is kind of COVID related. I'm not going to sneer at it. I'm going to say we need more. We need more than eight centers. Now, a lot of information or policy about how involved families should be appears in the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. I know that many of you know that this act gets renamed every time it's reauthorized. Right now, it's the Every Student Succeeds Act. Well, in the Every Student Succeeds Act, there are many places where it specifies that families have to be involved in, in decision-making meetings, particularly those that involve school improvement activities. If a school is in school improvement, then it has to have a lot of meetings to decide how we're going to get out of this improvement status. Oops, go back, please, and improve our program. So that means that uh, there are opportunities there for parents to be involved, but what happens is that doesn't happen very much. Uh, we, we would quickly brush that requirement under the carpet. We have our meetings quick and dirty at the end of the school day, not at a time when parents can get there, and um, it doesn't work out all that well. Now, 
there are other places where we find fragments of policy on family involvement in the elementary and secondary school emergency relief act which tries to help students with disabilities speakers of languages other than english and community schools and these other things the english language acquisition act the head start act race to the top individuals with disabilities and 21st century community learning centers the federal government does not have a policy paper on what their family involvement policy is. Right now, the National Association for Family, School, Community Engagement is planning on working with the federal government to come up with such a policy paper, in which case we would expect all new programs and grants and laws to include the same language rather than fragments. I guess I want to leave you with the idea that there's a lot being left on the table for families opportunities for them to help in decision making that are not being taken. Next. One element of federal policy that I'd like you to be aware of is something called the dual capacity building framework for family school partnerships. Uh, this has one really, really big idea I'd like to acquaint you with. Next slide. The idea here is that families and on our side, educators and staff don't really have a lot of capacity to build partnerships. We don't really know how to do it between families and schools. And we also lack a lot of opportunity to build that capacity. So when we say we're going to partner between these two groups, we've got two groups who aren't sure how to do it. That means that we have to kind of start before the beginning of a piece of work we want to achieve together. And we need to have some facilitated professional development about how to work together on decisions on what students are learning, on school improvement, whatever the matter may be. So I think this is something we need to take away from all this that we're not sure how to do this well and we have to pay attention to the fact that the parents aren't either and bring us all along the road a little bit before we expect great results. Next. I'd like to talk now about three tools that can be used in family community engagement. There's the parent teacher home visit project, community schools and community conversations. Next. Here we go. So community conversations is a facilitated way of finding out what the priorities are of all of the aspects of a community. Uh, particularly if you have a school and you have the neighborhood that feeds that school and you have the students and the families and you're trying to do something like reduce absenteeism or increase student learning, you have to get together and figure out the best way to do that and make sure that you're talking to all the stakeholders. Next. It might start with one three to four hour event and you have to make sure to get diverse members of the community so that people who are marginalized now have their voices heard. Uh, some people from the community have to be trained on how to be a facilitator. And uh, the structure of the event is well-defined to get everybody's voice out and to come up with a, a great needs assessment and then start planning for a solution. Next. Uh, one of the results is that it can create an open two-way conversation it builds trust with the community and establishes partnerships. Uh, you find common ground and you can identify priority needs so that as you build the thing you're building, a plan to address whatever the problem is, you make sure you're addressing the needs that people have and not just what you think should be addressed. Next. So as, as a result of a community conversation, stakeholders end up with a plan it reflects their values and can be used to set priorities. And this is the nice part. It can be used to request resources. If you're visiting the school board or going to your school district, when you say we have had a community conversation and here are our values and our priorities, please fund this. Next. Let's have a few words about parent-teacher home visit. I think many people who may be hearing my voice right now have either been involved in this or have heard about it at numerous conferences. It is a perennial that never gets old because it's tremendously effective. Next. So with parent-teacher home visit, 
teachers get trained to make home visits to families and they go in pairs. Um, they don't go and, and start with this, you know, your student is deficient in this or that, his or her behavior is not what it should be. No, it focuses on what are the hopes and dreams that the parent and the student have for that student. And you become partners with that family on trying to help them achieve those hopes and dreams for that child. A cooperative relationship is built this way. And teachers find that they end up having a partner in the home who can help them if any problem comes up with a student and people who are interested in helping the teacher with their agenda. Teachers are paid for participation. It is voluntary. It emphasizes finding that shared vision and values in each family, and it creates a really respectful relationship. Next. There are some great results, and there's data you can review on this. Um, it increases parental involvement, the attendance of the student at school. There are fewer behavior problems that end up in suspensions and expulsions. The family and the school share an accountability for that student. We have found that there are actually schools that come out of an improvement status, and the only intervention that they've had is participation in parent-teacher home visit. There are enhanced communications between home and school. Uh, the children and the parents have a shift in attitude about school. And the most miraculous part is that teachers have told me that some of them were considering leaving the profession, and then they participated in parent-teacher home visit and they got a completely new feeling for what they were doing and they know that they're supported from the home and they work toward that student's hopes and dreams. Next. Next. Let's talk about community schools. There are many schools that call themselves community schools and uh, we all have our own image of what that might be. Next. So a community school is the center of a community. It becomes a hub. And at that hub, we have education going on. We have recreation, cultural activities. We have health maintenance and civic partnerships that help provide for some of this. We optimize the conditions for learning by getting the students ready to learn through all of the things that they need. Next. So the NEA endorses a model that has five points. Uh, we recognize that a curriculum needs to be very strong at a community school, that we need to have great assessments that are not there just for stacking people in order, but they help teachers figure out how they need to redirect their teaching. And this is the one everyone knows, this third star here, the wraparound supports, the healthcare, the social and emotional services, the after school daycare. A lot of people think that if you've got those things, you've got a community school, but it's not enough. We also need positive discipline practices, including restorative justice. And finally, most relevant today, transformational parent and community engagement. A community school probably does a better job than other schools at involving parents and parent councils, but also in the decision-making that's usually reserved for the school itself. So we need more of that and community schools are ready to sort of make a structure for that to happen. Next. There are so many cities and towns that are doing community schools now. I should get rid of this page because I could never fit them all on. Here are some of the bigger ones, some of the more well-known places, um, but really they're happening all over the country, and there is increased funding from the federal government. Right now, about 75 million available. And it's not that expensive to do a community school once you start leveraging your local resources. Next. So let's talk about some policy issues that you might want to consider because again, teachers of the year have an enhanced teacher voice. When you decide to advocate for something, People listen in a different way they do than when regular teachers are speaking. Let's look at a few issues. Next. Uh-oh, HR 5. Some of you have heard of the Parents' Bill of Rights Act. It sounds benevolent. Parents should have rights. 
We all agree on that. This resolution, this bill, was passed in March in the House. And then it was sent to the Senate, and the Senate sent it to their Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. That's where it is right now. So Parents' Bill of Rights is this piece of legislation that supports censorship of school library books, of the curriculum, of the books that are on a teacher's shelf in, in his or her classroom, and even of PD materials that are being used with teachers. It requires parental consent for any change of pronouns or gender markers for students. Now, I don't know where you fall on all of the issues. I think it's important for all teachers to take a look at the Parents' Bill of Rights Act, read through all of the provisions, choose those that you think are good and those that you think are bad, and contact your US Senator right away and let them know that you either support this act or my guess is as an educator, you do not support it and want it to be removed, want it to be defeated. Um, we have a little, I don't know how much time we have. I don't know how long that committee is going to be ruling on all this before it goes to a vote in the Senate. So right now is the time to make your voice heard. HR5 is there on the internet for your review and you're going to see things that will concern you deeply as an educator. Please don't remain silent on this issue. Next. So this is from a letter that the NEA sent to Congress last month. Uh, HR5 tells teachers, counselors, other educators that even though they have education, expertise, experience, and dedication to their students, they cannot be trusted to work with parents and communities to determine what materials are appropriate, what curriculum meets students' needs, or even how to use assessment to ascertain their progress. So it points out that while these decisions are usually made locally, with mechanisms that are available locally, this, this law, if it should become a law, will remove all that and kind of make it a national, I don't know, a national requirement that things happen a certain way. And I don't think we want that. Next. There are some other issues out there that I think you will want to think about advocating for. Uh, the NEA is very concerned about honesty in education. Uh, this will mean something different to each person. To us, it means being honest about things that have happened in the past. Things about, you know, the slavery that this country endured. Uh, what happened to the Native Americans? What about the Holocaust? Can we talk about that? Can we even speak about things that are violent? And can we acknowledge that there are people in our country and in our classrooms who are LGBTQ? So I think this country is a wonderful country and it's very strong and it can withstand the honesty of admitting to the things that have happened in the past that have not been to our credit. But if we're going to build a better future, we have to know what those things are and make different decisions in the future. So honesty and education is the way to prepare our students for that. I've already mentioned the inclusion of families in decision-making and the presence of this in laws and programs that we're already using, but we often ignore these policies. As teachers of the year, I think you probably get yourself involved in a lot of committees, a lot of groups that are making decisions. It would be very helpful if you would look around and say, where are the parents? Where are the representative of parents here? And the answer should not be, well, here's Miss Cook. She has a child in this school, so she will also, you know, she'll be a teacher and a parent. That's not enough. And it can't be, here's our favorite person from the PTA. They always agree with us, and so they're here. No, we need to have parents from different parts of our community who will participate in real decision making and let their voices be heard. I've mentioned parent teacher home visits. I hope you'll go to their wonderful website, look at some of the data that they have collected that shows the effectiveness of their program and uh, consider whether you would like to bring a program like this to your school district. The training is wonderful and it's quite transformative. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about community schools, please go to the NEA website and look at our model. Uh, we're very interested in working with people 
who want to transform some of their schools to community schools from the grassroots level. Uh, we know that school safety is a huge priority, but Congress needs to pass laws that save lives and keep schools safe. And a number of the provisions that end up in Congress are things that do not do that. One thing that we do in many schools is we fund school resource officers. This is not something that keeps students safer. In fact, it makes the school a more hostile environment, especially for minority students who feel that they're being singled out by these school resource officers. It doesn't save lives. It doesn't make schools safer. There are a lot of other things that do not make schools safer, like laws that might require teachers to carry guns. Remember that one? Well, there are plenty of ideas out there, and your voices as distinguished educators would be most helpful in guaranteeing our school safety. One thing we do know, we must increase resources for youth mental health professionals in our schools. Many of our students are in crisis. They have no support. And these mental health professionals can turn a lot of things around before they become a tragedy. And finally, what did we learn during COVID? We know that many of our school buildings are in terrible condition and the school ventilation systems are even worse. That's part of school safety too. What kind of air are we breathing? So you might want to ventilate for that, ventilate for that, advocate for that when you see anything happening about refurbishing of schools. Next. There are some other things you could do. Um, it would be lovely if you reviewed some of the research findings about family involvement. Um, you'll find all this in the Beyond the Bake Sale book, but also as you look at other things. I'd like you to review uh, the US Department of Education's dual capacity framework. They have a part one and then a part two. And from this, you can actually learn how to enhance the capacity of both schools and families to work together. Think about whether a community conversation would help you in any of your partnership work, particularly when you're starting some new effort, trying to figure out the answer to a problem or make a new plan for the future. Uh, it would be great if everybody requested parent-teacher home visit training for their school district. It has tremendous benefits and some people think it's a lot of fun. And finally, if you're interested in community schools, See if you can arrange to visit a full service community school, talk to the teachers, see the students, and look at all of the resources that are focused on that educational community. Next. And next. So I'm very honored to have spoken with you this evening. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot that everyone could do, but you're a special group and uh, I think that you're probably a bit more practiced in speaking with politicians and speaking with families and making your voice heard. I hope that you've heard something tonight that might help you in your advocacy for your students, for families and for your profession. Thank you so much for listening and I hope to meet you again. And thank you so much, Barbara. Your wealth of knowledge and expertise is so appreciated on this topic. Um, for everyone joining us tonight, if you'd like to share this webinar with your um, other State Teacher of the Year friends, go ahead and do that. And you can find more information on our legislative education agenda for NSTOI for 2023 on the NSTOI website, www.nnstoi.org. So have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us.